All right. Uh, so we've got into a stage where we have a firm sense of what this so-called EDA process or exploratory data analysis phase is all about. Um, and really some, some key things that came out of there, um, uh, issues to do with the importance of using graphical techniques for you to explore the data, <coughs> right? So graphs, charts, and plots. And, and really the type of charts or plots that you use would primarily depend on the um, the type of attribute that you are working with, right? So for instance, if you are wanting to explore categorical data, um, there are certain uh, specific plots that you want to work with, right? Uh, usually uh, bar charts in my case, and sometimes to a certain extent, pie charts are usually helpful in helping uncover certain uh, important features associated with the data attributes. Um, we'll soon see, or hopefully you've, you, you notice when you are working with the exercise, um, that when you're working with numeric data or continuous data, um, it's important in certain instances for you to make use of histograms, for instance. Uh, another important thing that we, we raised was this whole notion of descriptive statistics, right? So uh, even more important, actually, when you're working with numeric data, just basic information associated with so-called frequency tables, for instance. Uh, so compute the average um, average of a particular value that you're working with. Um, um, right. So now, now would be a better time uh, before we transition to talk about data transformation, which is what we've been working towards here. Um, I thought it would be important for us to talk about um, uh, certain key activities or tasks associated with so-called uh, data preparation process, right? And, and of particular interest, really, um, and this is tied to the example data sets that we're working with, uh, of particular interest uh, things associated with attribute derivation, for instance, scaling of data attributes, um, and to a certain extent, how we go about formatting the data attributes, right? And, and the end goal, right, for all of this is to come up with this input data set that we are going to eventually transform and feed into the, the estimator, so the models that would implement, right? Okay, but before we, we really look at these uh, data, data preparation uh, tasks or activities, uh, I, I thought we'd just do a quick recap on the exercise um, that people are working towards and um, specifically making reference to, uh, ex I think it was tagged as a data set number two, but I've made changes here. Remember that um, if, if you look at the notebook that I shared, we, we are working with, so far, we, we are working with three different data, data sets, right? So there's the initial survey, there's the student initial survey coming in from the Google Forms survey that's given out to the students um, at the beginning of the year. And then there's the data set associated with student demographics, right? So this is pulled from the uh, student information system. And then finally, we have uh, a data set associated with assessment scores. Now, if you go to the, um, the version of the notebook that I shared with, with you, what you will notice is that, uh, if I can just get to it, oh, no, 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 no. What you will notice is that, uh, oh shoot, if I can just get to it. What you notice is that uh, the, the, the notebook has changed somewhat slightly. Uh, so the exercise I'm referring to is what you will find in the current version of the document, what you will find on page number, uh, on the last page actually, which is page number 22, right? Um, I think have I made changes to this? Right, uh, it's not formatted properly here. So the question was using this particular data set, you work towards the following, uh, you pre-process the data sets and then you merge them and then perform some very basic initial um, exploratory data analysis tasks. All right. Um, very keen for us to maybe have a discussion about this tomorrow when we meet, um, immediate after the seminar, of course. Um, I, I'd want to gain a sense of what people did here, but uh, I have my own vision of, um, I guess, the solutions, if you will. And, and I just want us to quickly walk through the two data sets, right? Um, and I know the exercise was centered around this particular data set, but you notice that my, my notebook also includes um, uh, includes the uh, exploratory data analysis associated with the student demographics data set. So I'll just quickly move to Jupyter Notebook. 
um, and go to exploratory data analysis um, and to make life a lot easier here I will uh, I will clear the output and then just rerun it from scratch. Uh, now the other reason why I'm uh, I'm going through this notebook again is um, there are a few a few things that uh, I've snuck in and I'll discuss them once we get there. Right? Uh, it turns out that they're important as you're preparing these uh, these pipelines. Data mining pipelines. Okay. So I'm just quickly running through um, parts that we already discussed in the previous screencast here, and I'm just going to get to the stage where we we start uh, working through the last two remaining data sets, right? If I can just get there. Okay, so all of these uh, graphs that we're seeing associated with the, um, the initial survey, which is data set number one, uh, very basic things we are doing, just plotting, because most of the data attributes you're working with are categorical attributes, right? Uh, so think of uh, gender, experience working with compu computers, for instance, and to a certain extent, ordinal values. Uh, like I think there's one or two questions that make use of a Likert-like scale. Um, so which is why I'm mostly using bar plots and pie charts here. Um, interestingly enough, though, uh, there's, there's actually... Um, an attribute that makes use of uh, uh, open-ended text, and so, which is why the visual representation here is making use of a word cloud, just to give you a sense of, um, you know, what what students were writing about um, as open-ended comments. Okay, so for data set number two here, uh, again, we're just going to do two basic things to explore this data or to perform an initial data exploration stage or phase. Um, we are going to process the data set, and then we, we're just going to draw graphs right to visualize the data um, and in, in in other instances we're just going to make use of uh, pandas describe function to just uh, uh, generate descriptive statistics associated with the data attributes all right um, again we access the data set by going through th that link there uh, this is all marked down so just run it um, First step, obviously, you want to gain a sense of how the data is structured. Again, here, I'm just taking a peek at the data, um, just rendering the first few or viewing the first few records. Um, notice that uh, my records are separated using a pipe character, right, or vertical bar. Um, uh, right? Um, and then I immediately use pandas to uh, in this particular cell, I use pandas to to import this this data set, this CSV file into pandas. So I create a pandas data frame and I give it a name of uh, var under bar ICT1110 demographic. Um, and this has become habitual for me, but uh, you're welcome to do this or not do it if you don't feel like, like doing it. But what I tend to do is the moment I import the pandas data frame, I spit out the columns, right? Um, I spit out the column so I can do a comparison of what I'm seeing in the uh, raw data data set itself. What I'm seeing as part of this raw data, um, I, I draw comparisons between this and what is associated with the pandas data frame, just to confirm that all the fields have actually been imported. Right. So you notice here, I just um, I, I just uh, call the columns attributes on the pandas data frame, and then it spits out all the different columns associated with this data set. Um, and then for good measure, obviously, to help with the, <coughs> the, uh, the activities that I'm going, the subsequent activities to be performed on the data frame itself, I rename all attributes uh, that have uh, names that I feel are going to be problematic to work with. And specifically, what I tend to focus on are things that have spaces in them. Right? Um, I've come up with um, a convention that uh, works for me. I almost always make use of uh, uh, camel casing. Is it camel casing or title casing? Could be title casing. Title casing for title casing for all column names in pandas data frames, right? Uh, so if you are programming in Java, what I'm making reference to here is things like uh, how you name your classes, essentially, right? So everything that is similar to student ID with a space is going to be changed uh, or transformed into a format without a space, right? And this is what I'm doing in the next 
in the next um, in the next cell here right where i'm just renaming all these columns so student id academic year and year of study are all renamed here and again i check that the columns have been renamed that they have been okay um, again standard practice i want to gain a sense of how many records i have associated with that particular data set and i see that uh, i see that i have uh, 60 records in there right just making use of the len built-in function, Python built-in function. Then the next step here is um, I, I just uh, render out uh, a few records using the head function, right? In this case, just two records, just to see exactly um, how these, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that, how these particular records have, have been imported into pandas. And I, and I see that um, the data set actually has this sort of structure here. Um, um, and then again, just to help me, to remind me of what I'm working towards, I identify the different attribute types that I'm working with. I notice that uh, uh, student ID is of a numeric, date of birth is a date, all the way up to um, uh, the accommodated field, which is a Boolean. So it's a yes or no type of, type of attribute here. All right. Um, and then as part of my pre-processing plan, I'm going through for this particular data set, because of the nature of the data set, I'm just going through two steps, right? I'm first of all going to remove or handle all now records, right? In this case, I'm interested in getting rid of all records that have now student ID values, right? If I come here, it's, it's pointless. It would be pointless for me to work with a data set that does not, or with records that don't have uh, the student ID why? Because student ID is a unique identifier, right? So the plan is to just remove all records with now student ID values, and then also get rid of um, duplicate records, right? And um, the process that I'm going through here to identify duplicate records is uh, really, I'm using the student ID as, as well as the key identifier. So if I find a student ID that occurs more than once, um, the plan is to get rid of it because that would be a duplicate record, right? Um, all other preprocessing tasks uh, other than these will be done as and when required, okay? Um, this is why I have a note here where it's saying now values will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, again, to ident for step number one here, uh, to identify records that are now uh, that have now student id values what i do is i just um, <clears throat> i take advantage of pandas is now function right so what this does really it returns uh true or false depending on whether the specified column you're working with we've specified here has a now value so observe if i if i run this all instances where the result is false means that the record does not have a now student ID value. However, instances like uh, uh, this row here, row number three, row with ID three here, with the value of true means that that particular record has a now student ID, right? Uh, and and there's, there's a couple of ways of trying to identify uh, which particular record has, or which particular records have in now value here. So I guess we'll have to do this. So what we mean here is we can, we can use this as a condition, right? Within our pandas data frame and just say, we, we wish to, we wish to, to filter all records, right? Where the student ID is now. And we want to see these things. Well, before we see them, actually, we'll just count these duplicate records. And you notice if I run len here, oh, two of them. That's unusual. Uh, so it turns out that we have two records that have now values, now student ID values. So uh, what I will do is I'll list all these two records. So you notice that uh, this is highly unusual. I'm wondering why, why you'd have such a record. So the plan is to get rid of these particular records, right? So a record with ID 3 and 56 have to go because they have now student ID values. 
um, I do believe there is a is it not now I think yep so if you, if you do the opposite and run not now you notice that what you want is this sort of data set and and really if you think about it what, what you could is what we could easily have done is uh, instead of because what we're doing is we're going to remove those records instead of removing them we could easily have created a new data frame that is composed of just these records that have uh, that do not have a now value for the student ID field that's besides the point anyway uh, so is now is fine for us again there's different ways of doing this doesn't matter in this particular cell though what we're doing is um, we now want to drop um, or get rid of the records these two records that have now values right remember when you did a check up here ooh, it's not should have been here when we did the a simple check here to find uh, to find out how many records are actually now we found two of them right uh, the records that have the now student ID field it's two of them <coughs> so the next thing to do is to drop or to get rid of these two records and this is what we're doing here we're saying um, uh, drop we're taking advantage of pandas drop na right drop na function um, and, and really what we do, what you do is you specify you feed it you feed it um, a condition where you specify which you optionally specify which particular uh, which particular field you want to check for now values for in this case we're saying we want to check for student ID if you don't feed it the subset parameter here what it will do is it will drop off fields that have now entries right so if uh, uh, I guess I'll render this again if if you if you don't run it with a subset parameter what it would do is if it finds a record if it finds any an, a record or an observation that has a now value for any one of these particular columns and it will drop that particular record but you want to avoid that right uh, which is why get back to not is now here which is why we are saying we specify that we're only interested in checking for nows against the student ID and through to that when we run this um, um, it deletes the two it deletes those two records and if we check we should have 58 right so those two records are gone and we have 58 records now um, another thing that is probably going to come up over and over again is this in place parameter so normally when you want to overwrite um, you, when you perform an operation on a pandas data frame and you want to overwrite the current the current data frame with the new data frame what you do is you pass it a in place parameter now some people will say uh, this is a it's bad practice and so what they'll they'll do instead of using in place is to to create a completely new data frame right uh, so you you just specify a variable and you say this variable is going to be equal to something like actually let me just do this up here so in, instead of going with this approach in cell number 57 where you you use the in place parameter what you could do is you could instead say you are going to create a new variable or a new data frame that is going to hold the result of you performing this operation. So observe, if I leave out the not um, the in place, the if, if I exclude the in place parameter, what this operation will do is it will return, it will drop those records and then return the result. But it won't but it will not overwrite the um, the previous data frame, right? So if you were to check the length of this thing here, demographics, before and after the operation, you still have 60 records. No, in this case it's 58 because, oh, we've already performed the operation. I'm sorry for that. Uh, I need to start from scratch up there, I guess. I'm sorry for that I'll, I'll have to restart this so come start from here I need to restart this so that I because the the data frame already has dropped values so I'll just restart this count we have two records uh, but before we run this I'll, I'll go with this approach here if, if I run this particular so you notice that we have 60 records before we, we perform this operation before you evoke drop in it um, but if we count the records again, if we scroll down and count the records, we'll still have 60 records, right? So what, what, 
what what is happening here is because we have not used the in place parameter the previous data frame is not overwritten right um, so this particular approach would typically involve you creating a completely separate um, variable in this case i've just appended an underbar in front of the previous data frame name right so that it holds so that it holds the result of the the data frame after after the two have been dropped so if i run this again you notice that we have uh 60 records before right we line number one results in 60 line number two we will drop the now the the two records that have now values for student id and then if we run, if we check the length or the number of records in this newly created data frame, you notice that we have 58, which is what we're trying to work towards here. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so we confirm here that we have 58 records. Uh, maybe this will be a bit confusing, so I'll just delete this, I guess. Cool stuff. Or maybe I can keep keep them just I'll just keep them so that it remains persistent anyway <clears throat> okay um, great so once once we do that uh, what we're doing in this particular cell is now we want to remove the duplicate records remember we, we are running two pre-processing steps we identify records that have now entries for student ID which is a unique identifier for this particular data set and then we we then go to step two where we remove all the duplicate records. Again, we are using student ID as a marker here, right? So for any uh, records where you have multiple student IDs, we want to get rid of them. Uh, to do that, we take advantage of, um, we take advantage of the duplicated function, right? Which you can run on a pandas data frame. And again, to remind us as we're working through these things that uh, Whenever you want to gain a sense of how a particular function works, all you have to do is put a question mark towards the end, and then um, then some contextual information will come up here explaining exactly how this works. But of course, I mean, uh, you could also make use of uh, offline documentations like Zeal, for instance. Um, like Zeal, which we had a discussion about last time. So. Okay, um, and I think I have pandas here in Zeal. Yeah, there we go. So you could just as well easily make use of Zeal if you want. But it turns out for me, I'm much more effective if I actually run this within the within um, within the notebook itself. Okay, so again, what we're doing here is we just want to print print all duplicate records. And uh, fortunately for us, for this particular data set, they are not duplicates, right? Uh, if there were duplicates, would then uh, run the drop duplicate function in this case. And I think I explained um, the idea behind the keep the keep parameter here. Uh, you, you tend to specify you have the option to specify which of the duplicate records you want to keep. Right. So in the event that you have three duplicate records, if you say first, then you're going to keep the first record that appears um, in the observation in the pandas data frame. Um, again, after dropping, it's always nice to just uh, confirm how many records you have. But in this case, because we had no duplicate records, we still have the 58 records. Um, again, always nice to just take a peek at the records once you perform these different tasks here. All right. Uh, now, now that we've performed those two pre-processing tasks, which is uh, removal of duplicates really, and now values, what we do is we just uh, we start the actual EDA process, just a preliminary EDA process. We just get a sense of the the pandas data frame itself. Uh, you can run the info the info um, the info function on the data frame to just get a sense of the data types associated with the with the pandas data frame itself. And my mouse is acting up here, which is a bit weird. I think I'm running out of battery power. Um, Again, for good measure here, um, uh, <coughs> I, I, I kind of like go through a process where I handle, or we are handling all 
we, we are handling now values for all the different all these different attributes so i come up with a decision for how i'm going to handle now values associated with the other attributes right and this is what i have in this cell i'm saying for for date of birth i will replace all all now values with just missing data right for gender i'll replace it with uh, u which represents unknown right um and if i scroll down to this particular cell this is essentially what i'm doing i'm just making use of the few na function associated with pandas data frames right um, and i specify as the first parameter i specify what i want to replace now values with and again this in place parameter comes up here so that uh, the changes are actually made on the data frame itself uh, so i'll run this cell where i'm replacing all now values for the different fields and then again i check the data frame to see if the now values have actually uh, become persistent and maybe this will make sense if we view five records let's see if there are any now values that have been replaced not quite but they they should be there but uh, i'm reaching here maybe 10 I'm trying to see if i can find an example where we have now values no okay oh there we go so if you look at uh and i had it here if you look at um this record number 51 you notice that it has for for this particular attribute which is minor description there's missing data right which is why i have there, there was a new now value which is why i have uh, missing data alongside um, the minor description attribute here for this particular record right so this is what i was doing or this is what we're doing in this particular cell here handling now values all right uh great and then now we actually go through the actual data exploration process for the uh, student demographic data set right um, again i'm just verifying or trying to gain a sense of uh, how the data is represented right so that i am able to make a decision on how i want to visualize these different observations here or these different data sets um, and uh, just by looking at this i come up with a decision on which particular data attributes I can visualize or include in the EDA process. So date of birth, gender, minor description, the sponsor, and uh, the status of accommodation for a particular student. Now, the decision of which particular, uh, which particular attributes to include in your EDA process would sometimes be contextual. It would depend on the problem that you're wanting to solve. Um, in this case, we already have an idea of what we're working towards. We've already made certain assumptions of what sort of factors would influence the overall student outcomes. We know that demographics are one of them, um, uh, which is why we're picking these. It's pointless for us to include some of these attributes like the program and the school because all students are associated with the same school, with the same program, with the same year of study. So it's pointless. These are our first years. Uh, or rather, ICT 1110 is a course associated with um, first years. So again, um, what I'm doing in this cell is just creating a new variable that's going to, that we're going to use to um, work towards the EDA process. And the first thing I do is I, I generate some very basic um, descriptive statistical information associated with the data set. Now, because the data set mostly comprises of um, categorical data, right, and not numerical data, it's the description, the describe function yields um, um, information that's not very useful at least insofar as these other um, these other uh, characteristics of the data is concerned right so mean standard deviation this is all pointless information because this is not numeric data but perhaps what's important is uh, the frequency associated with the data um, and things like the top value associated with this right uh, so of particular interest I want to draw attention to well, this is horrible. The minor description, it looks like we have a lot of missing data for the minor, right? Student minor. Uh, it turns out that most of our students are sponsored by the government for this particular program, which is interesting. And of course, most, if not all of our students are Zambian citizens. We don't have uh, foreigners, I guess, enrolled into this program. And interestingly enough, most of the students are not accommodated, right? So they don't have, um, they're not, they, they don't have university accommodation so they live off campus or something or maybe they um, they squat with other students all right so 
already I, I, I have a sense on how I can visualize these different things here, right? The, the, most of these are category. This, this, these attributes are categorical, like gender, minor description, sponsor. Um, so let's see how we can visualize these, right? So for date of birth, again, what I do is I just run these basic things where I, I want to gain a sense of the unique attributes associated with date of births and the counts. And what I, what I do at the end here is I'm interested in counting the years, not the actual date of birth. Right, because this the year is is the year use uh, it gives you a better sense of how how this particular data attribute is distributed rather than the actual date of birth. Right, so we can notice here that a uh, vast majority of our students were born either in 1998 or 1999. Here, right. Um, all right. Uh, so using this, I know that uh, uh, a bar plot is best. Uh, for visualizing this data and already you notice that this kind of presentation is much much better than a table here you literally have to squint to try and make sense out of this uh, i do the same thing for gender right um, gender only has like uh, two possible values and so a pie chart is perfect for that and using this i i, I see that uh, or we see that we have a lot more males than females in this particular course right or this particular program um, but it's an even distribution, really. I mean, it's just a difference of about two. Uh, I look at the minor description, and I do the same thing. And you notice that the vast majority of information is missing, but we have quite a number of students that uh, have minor in maths and civic education in history. Right? Again, if you look at this, you can already may, uh, maybe come up with with ideas on how you would you'd incorporate these particular this particular attribute into the implementation of the model itself if it turns out that the minor description is an important factor or it's a confounding factor if it has a causal effect towards the overall objective of what you're working towards right um, and then we look at the sponsors we do more or less the same thing visualize this we see that most of our students are actually sponsored by the government right so fully sponsored and 75% sponsorship here. Um, a few um, uh, related to members of staff, the dependents uh, here, the obtuition we, we've associated by, with the invest of Zambia. And then um, do the same thing for the accommodation status. We see that most of our students are not accommodated, right? Um, and if you look at the distribution here, really, uh, you can already, again, make a decision on whether you think um, whether you think uh, this particular factor can be incorporated into the overall model implementation. So do we think that uh, whether a student is accommodated or not accommodated will have an influence on the outcomes, the, the results, the overall outcomes? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, because the, the, the data is evenly distributed against these two options, then we can incorporate this, potentially incorporate it into the model itself. All right. Um, Hope, I hope that 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 kind of uh, makes sense and is, is somewhat good enough um, uh, revision on what sort of uh, data ED, ED activities you need to perform, how you visualize the data. And really, as you are going through this uh, Jupyter Notebook, I want you to always remember different ways of visualizing different attributes. Um, and by different attributes types here, I'm referring to things like uh, numeric data, ordinal data types categorical data, right? Um, continuous data, for instance. Okay, so we do the same thing for the assessment scores. Now, the, the assessment scores are kind of interesting because uh, for the first time, I think we're going, to, we're going to look at how exactly we go about visualizing, um, <coughs> visualizing numeric or con continuous, uh, continuous data, right? Um, again, I go through the same process where I import the data into pandas, I rename the fields. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through this because uh, we're already familiar with this. I, I count or I, I just inspect the data frame to try and uh, uh, gain a sense of how this data is actually um, formatted. Um, I delete uh, data or observations that have now values right on the id field because it's pointless to have now values against id field um, 
I handle now values, and you notice here, the handling of now values is somewhat different from my categorical data. Um, the assumption we're making here is that if a student has no entry for the assessment, then that student did not write the assessment. And because the student did not write the assessment, we assume that, not we assume actually, they get a zero, right? So which is why we're saying uh, for this particular data set, replace all now values with a zero value. And again, a reminder that this assessment data set has uh, three types of assessments. There's the exam scores, and then there's the test scores. So we are handling, we are working through the exam scores here. Um, we run that, um, and you notice that uh, we, we have this sort of structure as part of our pandas data frame. Then we do the same thing for test scores now. A reminder that test scores have four separate um, data files for test one, test two, test three, and test four, right? So we import all the test scores um, and we rename fields as and when required, which is what we're doing there. Uh, we count the records associated with the test scores, right? And really this gives you a sense of how many students wrote the test here. 61 for test one, 59 for test two, 59 for test three, and 57 for test four. Um, a, a lot of things happen. Uh, this is a full year course. Some students drop off. Um, um, I remember, vividly remember some of them dropping off, actually. Um, students sometimes get ill and they're unable to write uh, assessments, right? So that explains why there's a bit of inconsistency if you look at the numbers of students writing test four, test one, or up to test four. And remember that these tests are spread across the different, um, different terms, so term one and term two. All right, so after I do that, I drop records with now values, right? And that's uh, records that have now student ID values, right? Um, and what this cell is doing really is just uh, printing out, printing out, uh, what I'm doing in this particular cell is I'm saying print out the number of record entries you have before you do the drop oper operation and the drop uh, and after the drop op operation. And what this does is it helps me gain a sense of um, how many records I have dropped. So for test one, I see that uh, two records have been dropped because they did not have a student ID. Uh, same goes for test two, two records are dropped, uh, two records for test three, one record for test number four, right? Um, and then, uh, this is interesting. I, in this particular in this particular cell, I merge all the different test records, right? Because these these particular things here, these particular data sets are related to each other. They are all tests, right? They are associated with the same assessment category. I merge them, right? In this particular cell here. Um, now there's different ways of merging these. Uh, you can use concat if you want to. Um, for, for, for the most common techniques, really, the, the merging is normally done in between two data sets. So if you have four, in this case, we have four data sets, what we would have had to do is, first of all, merge test one and test two, and then use the result of test one and test two to merge with test three, use the result of that to merge with test four, right? So we'd go through a series of processes. But what I'm doing in this particular cell is just taking advantage of the lambda function, really, to just uh, do it all in one step. But the, the key thing here is, um, uh, you want to read up on how this works there. Yeah? The key thing here is that um, the resulting the resulting operation uh, or the resulting output looks like like this cell here or this output here, right? Where you have for each student you have test one, test two, test three, and test four scores here as part of one data frame. Um, and the reason you're doing this is you as you're doing the EDA process you want to visualize related data sets or related attributes. In this case, the tests are related to each other. So you want to ensure that the visualization um, of the operations that you're performing as part of the EDA process involve all the different tests. Um, and then similar to the exam score, I fill all now attributes, uh, all now values, right? Um, this is what I'm doing here. <coughs> um, and then I do the same for the other assessment category, the quiz scores. I create the data frames for all the 20, uh, for all the 20 uh, quizzes, so quiz one up to 20, right? Uh, and you notice 
that uh, in this particular data frame, right, what I'm doing is I'm going through a very primitive process of uh, importing each of the individual uh, CSV files. So CSV files associated with quiz one through to quiz 20, right? So I import them into separate uh, data frames and then I start processing those data frames. But of course you don't have to do that. You can easily, um, you can easily um, use, loop through the, the, the different quizzes here because they're somewhat related by taking advantage of uh, 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 typical for loop in Python. This is what I'm doing here. I just, uh, I, I create a data frame, right? And um, I'm saying, um, I'll loop through for each of the quizzes. And for each quiz, I dynamically create, um, what, I, what I've decided to do is this dic dic dictionary is the one that's going to hold the different quiz data frames. So I'm saying um, loop through all the quizzes and for each quiz, create a unique key associated with that particular quiz, right? Um, and then if that particular quiz is less than 10, so quiz one, two, three, up to, ten, up to nine, then what we do is we must dynamically create the input data file so that it has a zero after the quiz wait. So what I mean here is that um, for you to be able to dynamically read this, for you to be able to dynamically read something that's similar to this here, you need to process, you need to, as you are looping, you need to process uh, one through nine differently from 10, 11, up to 20, right? So which is why I have this simple condition here to check to say, um, if, if the quiz I'm processing is less than 10, then I append a zero before that. Otherwise I don't append a zero, right? And then afterwards, what I do is for each, for each one of these, uh, for each one of these, these quizzes that I'm, these quizzes that I'm processing, I want to, to create a data frame associated with the dynamically created file here, right? So this is what I'm doing here. Essentially, what we're saying is that, um, what we're saying is that what we're doing in this particular, in this particular, uh, in this particular cell is, is the same thing we'll be doing in this cell where we manually process all the 20 quizzes, but it's, I mean, that's, you don't want to do that, right? When you can, you can somewhat uh, go through this process in, 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 a, in a much more elegant way. Right. Okay. And then uh, we go through the same process as the other assessments where we want to rename these things here. So student ID to something that uh, um, is easy to work with, no, 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 co no punctuations within the names. And then um, this mark, this mark attribute will be named to something much more consistent, right? So quiz one will be, instead of mark quiz one, we'll have quiz one score quiz two score for quiz two, quiz 20 score for quiz 20, right? This is what I'm doing here. So that when we check the data frame, instead of having mark against, instead of having mark, instead of having mark against uh, the score here, we have quiz number and the score, right? And this is for all the 20 uh, quizzes that we're processing. All right, uh, again, just to kind of remind us that uh, instead of using this loop here to rename uh, the quiz columns, what we could have done is we could have done it manually like so, right? Which is what we have in this cell. But again, this is primitive. It's not necessary when you can do it in a much more elegant manner. And then similar to the other assessments, we drop all quiz, uh, uh, observations or records that have a now student ID. Uh, and then finally in here, we merge all the quizzes so that we come up with one contiguous uh, data frame that has the scores from all the 20 quizzes, right? So this is what we're doing in this particular cell here, in cell one, two, two. So that when we run this, we, s we somewhat have this particular, uh, we have this sort of data frame where each student has a quiz score. Each student record has a quiz score, right? 
Once we do that, we handle now values for this newly created data frame by just replacing them with a zero. Again, the decision we've made is that if a student does not have a quiz entry, then they got a zero in that particular quiz, right? And then we inspect this to verify that uh, the now entries have actually been replaced by zero. So you can notice here that you should have some zeros here. Quiz number 16, quiz number 17 for these particular students. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, I, I, I specify a pre-processing plan here associated with well, this is redundant, was it supposed to be there, it should be deleted here. The next step is to, to now perform the EDA process associated with this particular, uh, the, the three created or pre-processed um, data sets, the ones that we've made. So exam score, uh, test, uh, test scores, and quiz scores, right? Um, and the easiest way of doing this really is, I mean, the, you, you could think of how to visualize this from different perspectives here, but uh, a very common way of representing continuous data is by taking advantage of um, histograms, right? So what I'm doing in this particular cell here, in cell number 126, is I'm making use of a uh, seaborn to plot a distribution, right? A distribution plot. Uh, I'm trying to gain a sense of how students actually performed in the final exam, right? And you can see here, it's somewhat almost uh, a normal bell curve, I guess. Uh, the vast majority of students did pass in the exam, which is good. Some failed, right? Um, and then a few got really great marks here, right? A few of them. Um, again, nice way of visual visualizing, um, visualizing uh, continuous data here. I do the same thing for test, uh, for test scores, right? Uh, ignore this, this was supposed to be test scores, but I do the same thing for test scores and uh, what I do in this particular cell is I I, I plot them, I, I plot all the four test scores, right? In the same line so that I can easily have a firm sense of how the performance was like in the different tests, right? Uh, and again, uh, the plotting, plotting uh, results associated with the test here might yield interesting patterns, perhaps not, right? Uh, already I can see here that uh, most students failed in test one and test two, right? Or they got really poor marks in, in the first two tests, right? Um, actually, the performance was poor in all the tests here, if you notice, right? which is kind of sad, really. Uh, take, take note of the x-axis here. If you look at the scores here, Tests are out of 50, pass mark is 25. No, sorry, pass mark is not 25. Test is out of 50, um, pass mark is supposed to be, uh, not, not 25, it's supposed to be 45% or 50, which is 22.5, right? So I want to make sure that the, the, the student, so, so what we're saying here by passing is, if a student gets a mark that is uh, 22.5 and above, then it's a pass, right? So, um, but the performance is quite poor here for test one and test two. Okay, okay for test four, not so good for test three. Um, and performance was probably better, I guess, in test two or something, I don't know. Anyway, but again, whether or not um, what sort of visualization to do is dependent on the problem you're solving. Um, so we do the same thing for quizzes. We again plot a distribution plot because we are we are working with continuous data for the assessment scores. And uh, the way we are plotting the um, the kind of like um, the distribution for the quizzes is similar to the test here where we we plot everything onto one graph here. And you can notice here as, as I'm scrolling down here that that in fact the, the, the outcomes from the quizzes gives you an idea, because the quizzes are mapped on to topics, it gives you an idea of the, perhaps the problematic topics or the topics that students get to struggle most with, right? Observe, if, if you look at the first, the first couple of quizzes here, the performance is not that bad, right? Uh, and you, you gain a sense of whether the performance is not that bad by looking at uh, the 
five, the five, the threshold of, by taking into account the th threshold of five, right? The quizzes are out of 10. If a student gets at least five, then the performance is good. Quiz one, the performance was okay. -ish. Quiz two, yes, okay. -ish. If you look at the distribution here, quiz three, not so good. Most of the students got less than five, right? So uh, spelling out that perhaps students were struggling here, right? Um, so again, as you're browsing through here, you notice that uh, really there are interesting patterns that you get to notice depending on which quiz you're looking at, right? Um, and by the way, for some of these quizzes, some of them were take-home quizzes and we did notice that there was a lot of academic malpractice actually. So which it explains, uh, it explains why the performance looks like it was really good for some of the quizzes here. Okay. Um, um, but it turns out you don't have to manually uh, manually do do this, the plotting, like what I'm showcasing in this particular cell here, cell 130. What you can do is you can take advantage of uh, Seaborn's uh, facet grid, right? Uh, so if I if I can showcase how it works here, what I did in cell number 30 here, where I was I was manually plotting each of the 20 quizzes, of course I could have easily looped through this. I can do in one line using Seaborn, right? Uh, I just take advantage of the facet grid function here. If I run this, you notice that the same thing that I, the, the same process I went through, I can generate in just two lines of code here. Uh, so again, it's, it's smaller graphs here, but same, same output as above here, right? Um, great. Uh, I, I hope this. I, I hope I hope people are able to walk through to work through this exercise uh, in more in line with what I just explained here. But you notice again, takeaway point here is that uh, the visualization that you go through is dependent on the type of data attributes that you're working with. Um, again, uh, depends on what sort of tool you've ad adopted. Some of these visualizations could just as well easily be used by uh, alternative tools and not necessarily pandas um, or, or fancy uh, graphing packages and libraries like Seaborn, right? Um, you could do it externally using Excel if you want to, um, if you're more proficient with Excel. But remember that once you do your visualization, you expert to data analysis, you probably have to import the data into pandas still. Um, you could use a, is it Tableau or something, right? It's become a somewhat uh, popular tool to, um, to use um, for the EDA process. I don't know if people have actually come across this, but if I can quickly go to uh, Tableau, right. So they have um, they have the free version, which is called Tableau Public. So you might want to look into that, right. Um, uh, very, very popular tool. You probably want to look into it if, if you're interested in that. But anyway, um, <coughs> it's, but what I found myself is I'm more effective if I actually do all of these different different stages associated with um, the CRISPR-DM model, right? Or associated with data mining, really, or in in one particular um, one particular application. In this case, you notice we're using this using Python um, within this Jupyter notebook, right? Um, it just turns out to be much much easier to do that, but I thought um, before we transition to the data preparation tasks here, I thought I'd just quickly walk us through uh, or introduce a very uh, interesting technique that is extremely useful when you're embarking upon data mining projects that involve some aspects of machine learning, right? So saving the state of the various stages that you're working on. If you think about it, right, we. We've, we've actually worked on various stages here. The previous notebook this, uh, uh, walked us through pre-processing stage. Um, what we are going through now is the exploratory data analysis stage. Afterwards, we, we embark upon um, a few other additional data preparation activities that we need to perform, and then finally data transformation, then modeling. Um, what you soon discover is that it, 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 it is sometimes important for you to save the state of these different stages, right? Um, and a library that I have found useful uh, for this particular task is Joblib, right? Of course, there are other 
other libraries out there, like I think within Scikit-Learn you also have access to PIC or something. Um, and uh, I believe one of these links here, I think it should be this link here. It takes you to an interesting Stack Overflow discussion where people explain why Joblib is, is better, right? Depending on what you're doing anyway, it turns out it's much more efficient. Um, but for this particular um, for this particular stage, I thought I would just quickly show us exactly how you get to save a particular state, right? So what we're going to do is just save the stage of the pipeline where we are at, that's the exploratory data analysis phase, so that when we transition to the data preparation stage, all we have to do is reuse the saved state, right? Uh, and we use uh, two features here, it's a joblib dump function and the load function. So you use dump to save the state, you use load to refer to the saved state. Um, and really, the saved state is nothing more than a data file that you refer to, right? So it's, it's the, the entire process is somewhat serialized, right? Um, there's more information uh, on the official job lib. I don't know if this is official job lib uh, page, but uh, there's documentation here that explains exactly when you might want to use the dump and the load functions. And there's a very nice uh, use case example given here, similar to what we're going to walk through just now. I do encourage you to read through the documentation, by the way. All right, so on with it, we're going to save the state. Remember that what we're interested in is saving the pre-processed uh, or the pre-processed pandas data frames associated with the four data sets. Is it three data sets? Uh, so we have the initial survey, we have the student demographic data set, the initial survey data set, the initial, um, the initial survey data set, we have the student demographic data set, and then we also have the uh, student assessment scores data set. Uh, so what we want to do is before we actually get to the stage where we perform those other additional data preparation activities, we save the state, right? Uh, and again, a reminder that the assessment scores have quiz scores, uh, test scores, and examination scores. Uh, so using Joblib is quite easy, really. You need to import Joblib from scikit-learn.externals, right? As I'm doing here. Once you do that, you just run joblib, uh, you just run the dump function, um, which is available in joblib. Text in, by default, takes in two parameters. The thing that you want to save, in this case, is this pandas data frame, and the name that you want to associate with that saved state. Um, in my case, I use the convention that you find in literature where each saved uh, state is abbreviated by PKL, which is short form for a PICO, right? It's a PICO file. Uh, so you notice here the output is uh, the actual file that will have this saved state. Uh, and true to that, really, if I navigate to, and I'm sorry about this, if I navigate to, uh, if I navigate to um, the the location on disk where I'm running this Jupyter notebook from, who. Okay, where I'm running this Jupyter Notebook from, you notice that, uh, Christ, you notice that I will find that file, right? I don't know if you can see this file, this Pico file here, yeah? I've just created this Pico file, and so this thing here is 63 kilobytes in size. Now, you soon notice once we start uh, implementing these machine learning models that uh, for, 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 for safe states associated with these models, right? Uh, the file is usually extremely large. Uh, so it dependent on what sort of operation you are performing. And if I can just showcase an example here, I think I do have an example, I, I hope I do. Uh, unless I've backed up that information, oh Christ. Great, so if I go into the script directory here and I just check for Pico files, you notice that uh, some of these files are quite large, right? If you look at this file, for instance, 26 megabytes in size. Right, uh, this happens to be. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find the machine learning model that was saved here. Can't find it. Oh, there we go. Not so large. If you look at this, is stochastic gradient descent um, model here, uh, and it turns out that uh, saving the state of the model like this becomes incredibly useful when you're deploying the model. Right. 
because all you do is you save the the, the train data set um, and then you 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 actually incorporate this particular saved state or the saved model as part of the um the part of the application that implements the deployment or that uh, waits through the deployment phase of um of the problem that you're solving but key thing here is uh you import joblib and then you dump uh, the state that you want to save and specify the file where you want to save it to. So you notice I'm doing the same thing for demographics, right? I dump it here. Um, and then I save the state for all the three assessments. Quizzes, tests, and the exam. Boom. And then this is saved. Uh, so you, you very soon we, we get to see exactly how we get to uh, we get to we get to make use of uh, saved states. Right, but to maybe as an example here, I will I'll quickly showcase exactly how we can do this. Right, so assuming you've saved, you've saved this, uh, you've saved, um, you've saved a file such as this, for instance. Oh, sorry about that. You've saved, um, let's see, you saved a state. Like uh, let's look at the exams, for instance. Saved it in this file, right? Uh, to make to refer to it, all you have to do is you make use of uh, joblib dot load right and you specify the file that you want that has a saved state right the serialized save state uh, of course you need to assign uh, example assign a variable right so example saved state um, and then once you once you run that you notice that you actually have access to uh, to this thing here if I say columns here, this will, will have the same sort of, it will have the same sort of information as the initial data frame that I created. So, so, so if you if you sit down and think about this, really, you realize that uh, this is useful in instances where you don't want to, where you'd have to rerun certain phases of the pipeline. If if I was to share this. When I share this data, this Jupyter notebook with you, for you to get to the stage where we are at right now, we'd have to rerun all the different steps. To avoid doing that, what you can do is just make reference to a saved state and then start from there. Right. So um, it turns out that uh, this particular technique is incredibly useful in trying to avoid you uh, rerunning steps associated with your data mining pipeline. All right, great. I'll pause for now, uh, and then we'll continue off with the uh, with the uh, data data preparation notebook, where I'll quickly just walk through some uh, data preparation tasks. Really, uh, just a reminder though that the notebook, the updated notebook, will be shared, and you notice that the number of pages are drastically increased. From um, if I can get to this stage, from is it twenty three to sixty one to sixty seven pages. Don't, don't worry about the number of pages. It's just that the notebook has the output as well from the cells, right? So you want to pay particular attention to uh, to page number 22 up to 67 here, which has pretty much the same things I was walking us through here. Um, all right. So, all right. I'll see you in the next screencast where we get to discuss um, uh, some key data preparation some additional data preparation tasks or activities that we need to perform. Uh, 